Welcome to tonight's Nuts and Bolts of New Ventures. Just to recap for both you and the people that are remote, uh, last week we started with an introduction from me about uh, the overview of new ventures. We talked about a couple things to think about, including uh, creating value and capturing value. We talked about the three whys that you should think about as you look at a venture for yourself or to invest uh, why this? Why is this something important uh, that's worth your time or your money? The second one is why now? Why is this the right time to do whatever is being proposed? Uh, could be a variety of reasons. Sometimes, especially for technology companies, you get a little bit ahead of the curve. So that's a good question there. The third is why this team? Why do I think the team that I'm looking at or the people I'm surrounding myself with, why do I think we can do it? And then the fourth why, if the other three are all positive, is why won't this work? What are the things that are going to be the impediments? And then I gave four examples of um, lessons I learned around the kind of components you need for a successful new venture. And that included an idea, execution, timing, and people. And if you get all of those to, to connect correctly, you're likely to increase your probability of success. That was the first part of the first evening. The second part was Bob Jones, who came and talked about finding your customer. And if you can't find a customer who values what you're doing, then you don't really have a venture at all. The second night, we had Mindy Garber come in and talk about uh, negotiation. And we ran through some negotiation uh, drills. Uh, and she was followed by a panel on organization and people issues, you know, people issues being one of the major reasons that ventures fail to, to meet their potential or fail in many cases. And then the following night, we had uh, Ken Zolot come in with the Founders Journey, where you got to interview uh, two founding teams that are in the process of launching their ventures. And then I finished up that evening with a, a, a quite uh, fast and, and information-packed legal issue thing that probably blew by many people, but you have the deck, so you'll have a reference point. So that brings us to tonight, and we're going to do two things tonight. Bob Jones is back for the first part of the evening. If you have all of the things right, but you can't present your venture, uh, you're going to have a problem. And so Bob's going to help us talk about that. And then it will follow after that with Rich Kibble talking about business models, which is the how do we capture value component. Um, and then... Uh, I'll tell you tomorrow what we're doing tomorrow. So without further ado, Bob Jones, you're back. And uh, would you like to present your venture, sir? Thanks, Joe. Well, it's nice to see you guys um, again. Congratulations for making it through the first week without self-destructing. How many of you made it to all six sessions last week? Impressive. Impressive. And did you learn a couple of tidbits that were keepers that you will take with you when you finish all this? Kelly, right? You're Maria. Kelly would get close. <laughs> well, before I get started with the agenda, let's take just a second to check in with you on a matter of uh, relating to public humiliation. How many of you are comfortable on your feet speaking to an audience? Excellent. How many of you would rather jump off a bridge than stand in front of a group of people and give a talk? <laughs> okay, well, to some extent, tonight might be an equal opportunity embarrassment program. Um, last week, I commenced my session by leading by example, by embarrassing myself and walking you guys through in considerable detail something I did, which was an abject failure. Um, so tonight might be your turn, if you're brave. All right, well, here's what we're going to cover. This happened once before. Ah, 
why I think you want this. If you're going to do it, how you can do it well. And then your turn. But first, a question. We picked 12 units for these six nights. We came up with topics. Why did we pick this one? You finished up, you're, you're doing things that are sort of qualify as hard skills, right? Accounting, financial projections, et cetera. Why did we pick this topic? Why do we think it's important? And if you would evaluate your own skills as a five on a scale of 10, and after tonight, it jumps up to seven or eight, so what? So your thoughts, why is this important? Sorry. People invest in people. Okay. That makes sense. What's the connection between that and presenting your venture? Ooh, ooh, write that down. If you cannot present credi credibly, there's a challenge to your credibility as particularly if you're someone seeking investment. Fair enough? All right. Well, I'm going to answer my own question. There are a couple of places where I think you will want this. If you're out acquiring customers, if you're out acquiring a prospective partner, someone who says, you know, we have a strategic, we have a group of customers who want 5,000 of what it is that you sell and we don't have it. Can we work together? What if you want to hire a staff and the people that you're thinking of all have other offers, most of them for more money than you can afford to pay them, but you want them anyway? What happens if you have had a bad quarter and your ability to make payroll is jeopardized and your staff is feeling demoralized? What if you need to go out and raise money and maybe even one day sell your company? So I submit to you that all of these are occasions when your ability to present a venture makes sense. And if you're good at it, you'll be glad that you got good at it. So you hacked into my computer this afternoon while I was making this slide, right? <laughs> so what do people invest in? Well, Many of you have an idea, and you may be able to turn your idea into a product. But a good idea isn't the same as a good product. So maybe you're hoping to build a business, but a good product isn't the same as a good business. People want to work with promising businesses, and they want to know you have a great team, that you guys can do what you're supposed to do, and that you actually understand your business. And one of the hallmarks of whether or not you understand your business is can you describe it clearly and persuasively? And I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs who will spend 30 minutes talking about their technology and never get to the fact that what they sell is washing machines for people who have dirty laundry. Right? It does not have to be made complicated in order to become believable. So we covered this last week, but yes, I started four healthcare companies with a bunch of docs out of Harvard Med School. Uh, I've served as a mentor for MIT's Venture Mentoring Service and a national advisor for a group called Pipeline. I boiled down some of those experiences, and melded them with my own and wrote a book called the Startup Starter Kit, How to Avoid Failing in the Crucial First Two Years, because so many of these promising people started businesses that flopped. I took a break from entrepreneurship for a while to be CEO of a company that's publicly traded on the Hong Kong Exchange, had a couple normal jobs, went to a couple of schools, and I'm a routinely working musician played this past Saturday night, play all the time. Um, and I do a fair amount of volunteer work at homeless shelters. In fact, uh, that was this past Thanksgiving. 
In about two weeks, I will be at the Pine Street Inn for women doing a solo gig for their Valentine's Day celebration. I will be the nerdy musician sitting in the corner playing background music while they serve tea and crumpets to their guests. So how do we do it? How do we take this idea and actually make it work? So here's a crash course in a bunch of things that I suspect most of you have not encountered in your classes so far. We're going to cover a few sales fundamentals. I'm going to teach you a couple of acronyms that add to your toolkit, like WIFM and RTV. I'll explain those. We're going to talk about presentation fundamentals, understanding your audience, how do you engage them, and more. We're going to have a few minutes on how to use a microphone properly because you cannot believe how many times I see <clears throat> entrepreneurs. Oops. A little bit on what it takes to raise money. And trust me, that's worth far more than the 15 or 20 minutes that we're going to spend on it tonight. A template you might use for doing all that, and then it will be your turn. Okay, so far? All right. Selling. Might be a new concept for the technical founder, because if you go to a place like this, you are led to believe that the facts are really all you need. You need to get to the right answer. It's the square root of minus one or whatever it is. And the idea that someone who's got a less good idea than you might triumph because they do a better job of persuasively presenting it is hard to grasp, but true. So when you think of salesperson, do you think of Slick Willie here? My view is that that's not quite accurate. It's an essential skill. I think learning to sell is a little bit like learning to swim. Very few people are born knowing how to do it. It's not natural. It's not innate. And many of us initially find it to be terrifying. But just like learning to swim, it is learnable. It just takes techniques and it takes practice. And many of you may never turn out to be Katie Ledecky or Michael Phelps, but you can learn how to swim. And you need to know a bit about how to sell, and we're going to talk a bit about that tonight. People who are analytically inclined often find themselves much more comfortable doing analyses of Google AdWord campaigns rather than actually learning how to look at somebody face to face and say, I've got something I think you need, right? That's a little bit like analyzing where is the optimal place to go swimming, but it's not the same as jumping in the water and not drowning, right? You probably need them both, but they're not the same. Some fundamentals that you really must know is, are you talking to the right person? We're going to elaborate on this a bit. What does that person actually care about? We're going to talk a little bit about benefits versus reason to believe. I have to tell you that with one of the companies I had, at one point, one of the investors was Procter & Gamble, which at the time was about $80 billion in annual revenues. And you could get my company in my car. So there were comic aspects to this. But when I started spending time in Cincinnati, where they were headquartered, they pretty much got out their tattoo gun, said, roll up your sleeve, Bob. And they wrote benefits first, followed by reason to be leave. I'm going to elaborate on that a bit, but it will become crucial to your selling. The role of trust because what are you really selling most of the time? Yourself. And if they don't trust you, good luck. How to ask for the order. 
in the role of follow-up. So I have this word up here, qualifying. Who has an idea what that actually means in sales parlance? Anybody? Um, this is a diagnostic question. I sort of want to know how much sales training, if any, you've had. So any ideas what qualifying might be? Say that again. Setting them up. Well, if you're assessing a partner, yes, that's true. If it's a straight ahead sales call, that's a, a different thing because you're going to find there are a lot more people out there who can say no than who can say yes. And when you walk into most places, the first thing that happens is you talk to five people in a row who can tell you no, but none of them can actually tell you yes. So who you should focus on should be self-evident. And a lot of times, if you just say, how's this decision going to get made? They'll give you this sort of vague hand-waving answer. Oh, well, we all, you know, get involved and we all get engaged. And, you know, it's kind of a consensus. Nonsense. <laughs> You're never going to sell anything to anybody if you accept that answer. So a question you might consider asking is, if this thing goes belly up, if it turns out to be a terrible decision, who's going to take a beating? That's the person who owns the decision. And if they say, oh, well, it's uh, Susie Cream Cheese over here, then what did I do? She's the one. WIFM was the other acronym that's up there. It stands for what's in it for me. And when you're out there talking to people about investing in your company or buying your product, they're often too sophisticated to ask you this question directly. But trust me, they are thinking it. What's in it for me? So all your rapturous descriptions of your fabulous technology or if you're in the clean energy space, all of your passionate descriptions of how much good this will do for climate change, et cetera. You're talking to a plant manager who thinks right now, I never get awakened in the middle of the night because of the, something went wrong with what I'm using. If I get your stuff in here, it might improve the environment, but I'll be at risk of being awakened in the middle of the night because your stuff doesn't work. So guess which I care more about, right? So addressing this requires a little bit of finesse. And when some of you brave souls come down front in a little while, I suspect you will give us relevant examples because you will miss this point. Okay. Let's say that Aaron and I have invented a better lawnmower. And what makes it better is that the blades are really sharp because we have them manufactured by a German company that makes razor blades. And it's got a really powerful motor because we went to a Japanese motorcycle company specialized in a lot of power in a compact space. So it's a snazzy lawnmower and it's better. So we ring your doorbell and we say, we've got a really great lawnmower. And you say, I don't have any grass. I live in an eighth floor of a condo building. I don't have any grass. So the benefits of a better looking lawn more quickly are irrelevant to me. You say, thank you very much. <laughs> Next doorbell, right? If they don't want the benefits, stop right there. Okay. When you are talking to a prospective customer, why might they be suspicious of a technical explanation from an MIT grad? Yeah. 
get there might be another piece of that. I would be suspicious because I don't have the knowledge to verify whether the technical explanation is clear. That's a brilliant answer. Repeat that, please. It's okay. Um, that as a customer, I don't have the information to verify uh, whether that technical explanation is true or not. You can take the rest of the evening off. Well, that's exactly right. If you go into most places and you start talking to somebody who's going to own the decision if it goes sideways, and you bury that person under all kinds of explanations about the elegance of your algorithms and how uh, you've incorporated Maxwell's equations and you can do logarithms in your head, and they sit there and think, uh-uh. First of all, if I try to explain this to my boss, I'm going to look like the village idiot because I have no idea what you just said. Second, you are technically more adept than I am, and you could be lying to me, and I wouldn't know. And there is an art to boiling it down and making it simple. And you need to, if you'll forgive me, beware of your strengths right? Because your strengths can actually operate against you in this kind of situation. Trust. Trust is incredibly important. And the strength we just talked about can, to some extent, interfere with building trust. And the more important the decision is, the more trust is required. So what kinds of things build trust and credibility? Well, there's a lot of them. But Something that goes a really long ways is if you do what you say you're going to do. I will find the answer to this question for you. I'll have it for you by next Tuesday morning. And on Tuesday morning, you deliver the answer. And do that a few times. It helps. People rarely step up and say, oh, my God, this is wonderful. Please just take my money. I did have it happen once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, made my day, put it in my diary. But most of the time, you'd better ask for the order. And a classic sequence, I'm going to intermingle a little bit of sales parlance here. Do you guys remember a week ago we talked about what an open-ended question is? Anybody tell us what an open-ended question is? Okay, if I say, do you like it? And you say no. The conversation just kind of ground to a halt. So when we were asking people about our diabetes product, which I talked about a week ago, we learned not to say, how do you like it? We said, how do you feel about it? What are your thoughts? They'd say, well, when I eat seven chocolate bars in a row over the course of the week, I get a little tired of it. I kind of don't like the taste all that much. We'd say, okay, what else? Well, it seemed to work great. We'd say, okay, what else? Well, I'd like to reorder. Open-ended questions. So classic sequence here is, how do you feel about this thing I talked about, this lawnmower that Aaron and I invented? And they say, well... I'm worried that it, it's going to take my staff six months to learn how to use it. And during that six months, we're not going to be doing a good job for our customers. They're all going to hate me. I'm going to have a revolution going on within my office. An honest objection, right? So a template you might follow is first you validate it. Well, that makes sense. Switching costs is a real issue. I totally understand how you would be concerned about it. And I think as a good executive, you should be concerned about it. So I hear you. And then there's something called a trial close, which is say I could show you, and I'll come back with data for this, but say I could show you that you could address all of these switching cost issues comfortably. You'll be working it within two days, be comfortable with it in a week, and be experts, for example, within two weeks. How would you feel then? That's called a trial close. Okay, I will come back next week, and I'll bring you that evidence. 
And you say, okay, I did what you asked me to do. When can we start? All right. It's a template. You have to improvise. I've worked with lots of salespeople, and they sell in very different ways. Follow-up. You might be memorable the first time people meet you. But though I found this to be soul-crushing for me personally, an awful lot of people don't remember me at all until I've met them three or four times. Same might be true for you. That follow-up is essential. It shows your interest. It keeps you top of mind with them. Sometimes the follow-up can just be, hey, I read an industry article that was relevant to what we talked about. I just attached it. Hope you're well. I'll call you in a week and check in and say hi. Huh. Change when it got to your computer. Presenting. A few basics that can make a big difference. This little video is on the Nuts and Bolts website. How many of you have seen it already? If you haven't, watch it. It's not quite seven minutes. Remember that Joe put up an equation within minutes of the first session a week ago something about happiness and reality and expectations. This one is value comes when you emphasize the why more than emphasizing the how. Really important. Why you should want this. The problem, the pain that we're going to address, how we will do it comes later. But the benefits are the why. Watch it. It's worth it. Okay, two requirements to give a presentation that are successful is one, the audience has got to care. So a good fit would be with our lawnmower if we showed up and somebody's lawn is about knee high. And we said, you know, I know you hate to go back out there because the Chiefs are playing and you're a Kansas City fan, and you'd rather be inside watching football than outside sweating and slogging your way through all of that. But if you could do it in about a half an hour because of our whiz-bang, high-powered, super-sharp blades lawnmower, then you'd probably quit having your neighbors hating on you, and you could be back inside in short order. How do you feel about that? That could be a good fit. The other requirement is that they believe you. How many of you have ever talked to a salesperson and you suspected they might be, if not outright lying, maybe exaggerating? Fact of life, right? Ever bought a used car? <laughs> or talk to people who make nutrition supplements? Right, just two of these pills and you'll have biceps like Arnold's. Right? My supplement brings dead people back to life. So having them believe you has two components, that you have accurately described the solution and that you will actually do what you say you will do. Those are the basics for getting an agreement. So far, so good? So... The most important first step is to understand your audience. So here's a trick question. By the way, if you get it wrong, you should just go be a dentist. What do they care more about, you or themselves? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, I hear dental school calling. So... <laughs> Given that we understand that, when you're talking to them, should your goal be to persuade them that you're really smart or that your technology is really awesome or that your vision is really compelling? Maybe. But only if it supports the benefits that you started with. So... I'm going to say this, and at the risk of being pedantic, I'm going to emphasize it. Benefits first. 
you could get your lawn mowed, mowed in half the time and it'll look great. <laughs> Some years ago, I was briefly in the weight loss business and the, the snotty doctors and I had in, actually invented something which helped people lose weight. And I wanted to know if anybody besides us was interested in this. And so I, I set up at a table, looked like this, in Springfield, Massachusetts, it's indoors in a mall in front of a CVS that was stocking the product. And I had it spread out over the table. People would walk up and say, what do you got? And I would start talking about low glycemic index carbohydrates and low glycemic load and avoiding hyperinsulinemia. And I'd say, okay, thank you. After a couple of hours, I thought, I got to do something different. And I took up saying, it'll help you lose weight and you'll never be hungry. And they'd say, oh, my God, where do I find it? And I'd, well, it's aisle seven, but don't you want to know how it works? Nope. I only have one question, which is, will it work for me? How much is it going to cost me to find out? I said, 15 bucks. Okay, okay, aisle seven, see ya. The benefits alone. Oh, there were a few people who said, sure, I bump into all these people selling weight loss solutions and their snake oil. Tell me why yours works. That was about one out of 10. But when I led with the explanation, I got nowhere. And remember, their first priority is, are you going to solve my problem? What's in it for me? So a few guidelines in presenting to an audience. Try to understand what they want. How about that for a novel idea? Right. Do a bit of research, ask them, and listen carefully. I know it's corny, but it helps if you actually care a little bit about their problem. So. Part of what helped us make a success out of that diabetes business I described was we got to know a lot of the parents who were worried about their eight-year-old daughters. And then we got to know a lot of the people, the, the adults, who were worried that they would die in their sleep. And that encouraged us to invest more deeply in our customer relationships. So a sequence in speaking something like this that's often effective is introduce yourself, ask them what they're looking for, or confirm that you know what they're looking for. And I had an astonishing experience some years ago. I had moved to Southern California, and I took a job with the healthcare company that I mentioned that was on a tear to bump the sales up 50% and go public. I thought, I need some decent clothes. I'd been running a feisty little company in Chicago, playing the blues in the South Side at night, and I kind of looked apart. So I thought, well, I got to clean up my act a little bit. And my wife said, well, there's this new store that's opened in one of these malls. It's called Nordstrom. They're supposed to be pretty good. Let's go and see what they got. I said, all right. So we went there, and I'm sort of looking through the suits and the sales rep came over and said, what do you do for work? I said, well, I work for her and I named the company. She said, well, marketing, finance, accounting, manufacturing. I said, marketing. He said, ah, so you don't have to wear like a stuffy old guy baggy suit, right? You can maybe flash out a little bit? I said, well, you know, a little bit. He said, well, you're 40 regular. Yeah. He pulled out a suit, pulled out another suit. And he said, I think these might be a good match for the company you're describing. Why don't you go try them on? So I went on and tried one on when I came back out on the table four shirts, ties. He said, if you like the suit, this would look really great. 
with the suit you're wearing. I looked and I thought, geez, he's right. Well, I thought I was going to buy maybe, you know, a sport coat or something. I walked out with two suits, eight shirts, 10 ties, <laughs> a credit card that exploded, <laughs> right? And I was happy. I loved it, right? I mean, he sold me 10 times what I expected to buy. And I was thrilled, right? Because he asked me what I was looking for, showed me that what he had pulled out would cause me to look like an honest to God, sophisticated professional, which was a tough call at that point. And then backed it up. Oh, by the way, you know, the suits are well made and they're not going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. That's a, how do you feel about this? And he's like, well, I got to have it. Guidelines. Okay. We have agreed that we want you to be believable. What helps you be believable? Well, it helps if you have a bit of passion. But if you fall on the ground and start speaking in tongues, that's too much. Right? So passion, but not lunacy. Supporting evidence. We've got documentation that our healthcare product works, clinical trials, whatever it is. And brevity. Three guidelines for brevity. Be clear. Be brief. And shut up. Rule number two in selling is if your prospect says, okay, I'll take it, stop talking. I've literally sat with sales reps who said, well, wait, I'm not done. <laughs> I want to tell you about more benefits. I'm saying, shut up, take the order, right? Be brief. Everybody's busy. Experienced salespeople have a, an expression which is, don't spill all your candy in the lobby. Don't tell them every single thing you know. Ask yourself a really hard question. What is it you want them to remember? So turn your computer off and stare into space and say, if somebody asks them, what did I say? If somebody asks them to describe my pitch, how do I want them to answer that question? Make sense? So it's not what I'm pitching, it's what they're catching. Most people can't remember more than three points. It's got a powerful motor, it's got really sharp blades, and I can be back inside watching football in a lot less time than otherwise. Well, how does it work? I don't know. How much is it? I don't know that either. <laughs> right? Three points is about all that most people can remember. So be ruthless in your editing. So what's required to get this right? Marketing types have a phrase they like, customer intimacy. Understand the problem that you are there to solve. And it's not the problem you care about. It's the one that's causing them pain. What's the unmet need? What are the consequences of that unmet need? Who cares? Some years ago, we also invented a product for arthritis. Those of you who are familiar with Ayurvedic medicine, be interested in the herbal concoction that we put together. and We ran clinical trials and got it past the FDA, and it worked. The problem is we were competing with aspirin, which costs about a half a cent a pill. So the consequences of their unmet need for them was that if their arthritis fired up, they'd go take a couple of Tylenol or an aspirin or something. They were not interested in our high-tech whiz-bang solution. So what are the consequences of the need being unmet? And for whom? Who cares? Which kind of customer is too big and which kind is too small? Joe and I worked with a fellow in uh, this organization, Pipeline. He's in the data security business. 
He keeps your computer from getting hacked. And he was incredibly frustrated over his inability to grow the company. And we worked with him for a while and figured out that companies that had fewer than a thousand employees couldn't afford him. Companies that had more than 10,000 employees had their own in-house IT department and they did not want him anywhere near them because he would make them look dumb. So he was wasting a colossal amount of time chasing people who were never going to be his customers. And this was a forehead slapper for him. And he sent me a note three months later and said, Bob, based on that focus that you and Joe helped me achieve, my revenues in the past quarter were greater than all of last year. Thank you. So understand who's too small, who's too big. Why will they think your solution is better? What's also required, of course, is, as mentioned, good structure, ruthless editing. Organize your talk tightly, and excluding some people actually makes it better. Find the people that, if you like to dance, find the people who want to dance with you. A couple words about style. Slow down. You're going to see this in action in a few minutes with well-intended, really smart people come up and take this microphone. And they're going to talk a mile a minute about their product and all the wonderful benefits it has and how exotic the technology is on. Slow down. Public speaking requires that you speak more slowly than usual. Enunciate clearly and give your audience a chance to process all this important stuff that you're saying. And if they tell you you have four minutes and you look and say, but my six minute presentation is really awesome. I'm just gonna talk real fast and jam six minutes worth of content into four minutes and the net result will be, nobody understands a bit of it. Be careful how you deploy passion because again, if you look too crazy, no credibility. And here's the important thing. Avoid just dumping facts. Tell a story. Tell a story of a problem, the pain that the problem causes, and the solution. I spent a couple of days last week in Woods Hole on Cape Cod with a bunch of oceanographers who are doing incredibly cool stuff. And they want to commercialize, some of them want to commercialize the work. If you ever watched the movie Titanic, you know that James Cameron had this incredible submersible built to take him down a, a zillion feet underwater. It cost $32 million to make that submersible. It was there. <laughs> but in order to help at least one of these groups commercialize what they were doing, which was helping coral reefs that had been destroyed get reconstructed, and they went off on a whole tear about the ecological impact of coral reef destruction and so forth. And I sort of said, well, who besides you cares? And, and if you succeed in recolonizing these reefs, who would be pleased about that? And the more we got into it, the more it turned out we could say, well, these three people here own a hotel on a beach and they bring eco-tourists in every year who love to go rent dive equipment and snorkel out and look at the glorious multicolored coral reef and all of the really cool fish. And they don't want to come to the hotel to go see an ugly brown structure that died. So, Best intentions in the world, they're losing money, they're feeling the pain. I've got something that can help them. It's much more memorable than going into a whole lot of technology. Tell a story, don't just dump the facts. Okay, so far? Ah. I have never seen anybody talk about this. I've been to a bunch of conferences and speeches and et cetera, and nobody talks about microphones. A few years ago, 
the Mass Technology Council held a pitch contest and they invited a whole bunch of entrepreneurs to come stand up and talk in front of a room that included prospective investors and prospective partners. And I had licensed a bunch of technology from Harvard Med School. And I thought, well, geez, I guess I qualify. I'm going to go. There were slightly over 30 entrepreneurs presenting. And I won. And of course, I thought, well, of course I won. You know, my idea is brilliant. I'm brilliant. I'm charming and lovable. How could I not win? That wasn't the explanation at all. I was the only one who spoke that they could hear. Everybody else is. And you'd get this sort of Doppler effect. I was literally the only one they could understand. Probably the wrong reason for winning, but the point, <laughs> the point is they got to know how to use one of these. Everybody spends hours on what their slides and their presentation is going to look like, and they never think about what it's going to sound like. So here's a couple tidbits for you. Some mics are called omnidirectional. They'll pick up sound from all the way around, and they're useful if you're in a situation where you don't have a lot of competing sources of noise, like this one. You'll probably never use one of those. The mics you're going to use, like this Sure Beta 58A that I'm holding here, they are unidirectional. They pick up the sounds from certain pickup pattern right in front, and they suppress everything else because they're used by people like that. And they don't want explosions and symbols and so forth coming through the vocals. So recognize that the mic you're using is unidirectional and speak down the barrel of the microphone. Not like this. Not like this. Yep. Like this, okay? And the optimal distance is usually two to four inches from the microphone because the pickup fades quickly as you pull the mic away and it gets very gloomy if you get up close. Of course. You've all seen straight out of Compton and all of that, and you know that Jay-Z and those folks like to hold the mic way up here and do this. That's posing. It's like the guitar players who get that blues face when they're playing, right? It's posing. If you're speaking to an audience like this, two to four inches down the barrel of the microphone. Everybody got that? And speak more slowly than usual. Give your audience time to process all this stuff. And in a few minutes, I'm willing to bet that at least one of you who comes down here to present. So what if you like to gesture? What if you like to say this point here? Well, don't do this. Put the mic in the other hand. <laughs> all right, it's just little stuff. And I know it sounds silly and maybe even trivial. It will make a difference between winning and losing. Okay, there's an eight-letter word that all my musician friends, and come to think of it, all my entrepreneur friends, hate. Practice. So, if you see a speaker who makes it look easy, I can pretty well promise you that that speaker worked very hard to make it look easy. You're retraining yourself. This is not a classroom exercise. This is not you talking to your neighbors. You're learning a whole new set of habits. And I have been known to go into a conference room with a timer and give my talk to an empty room. And if I was really worried about it, I've torn pages out of magazines and put faces in the chairs. Now, that's a little neurotic, I admit. But the notion is, if you've got 10 minutes or 20 minutes or six minutes or whatever, set your timer, give your talk. When the timer goes off, ask yourself, what did I omit that I should have included? Practice. Do it again. 
How many of you have ever heard yourself on a recording? What was your first reaction? <laughs> oh, God, just shoot me in the face, right? <laughs> it's really hard. If you think that's hard, have, how many of you have ever been videoed? Mm -hmm. Soul crushing, right? It's just awful. <laughs> but, boy, is it therapeutic. Dig in, record yourself, listen to it, edit it, practice. Okay? All right. How many of you think that you might at some point need to raise some capital in your future? Lucky you. Well, I have just a few words for you. This is not for the faint of heart. Be careful what you ask for. Good investors can make a huge difference. Bad investors will kill your business. Okay, maybe this is a little tongue-in-cheek. Abandon hope, all ye who enter. This is a topic that you could spend hours on. We're going to spend five minutes. So understand this is just the headlines. But let's talk about what it takes to actually get in to see a venture capitalist. You could cold call them. That happens about 40 times a day. Doesn't work. Those calls go in the trash can. You could say, well, geez, do I know somebody who knows Joe? And ask him for an introduction. Well, that person's going to say, gee, Bob, you're in healthcare, and Joe only does software. It's not a good fit. So, no, and that request goes in the trash can. But if it is a good fit, then their next question for themselves, and they won't say this to you, is are you going to go in there and look like the village idiot and make me look bad? Cause Joe to call me up and say, good God, what I on earth possessed you to send me this turkey? And if the answer is, yeah, that goes in the trash can. So only if you make it through those hoops, you might get an introduction. That happens about twice a week. So don't go into this naively thinking, oh, well, it's going to be easy. It's not. And what do these prospective investors care about? Is it your technology? Is it the schools you went to? Maybe it's getting back more money than they put in. Ooh. We're getting warm. So they're going to be thinking, well, what's broke that you fix? Who's got the problem? Why are they going to like what you've got? Why this? Why now? Why this team? What could go wrong? Why won't it work? Questions that you've already heard several times in the past week. But that's what it is. Some of the questions they'll have of you, what kind of capital are you looking for? Are you thinking of a convertible note? Are you thinking of an equity investment? What did you have in mind? How much are you looking for? How far is that going to take you? It's going to last a year, okay? And what's going to happen at the end of the year? I'm going to need twice as much more money. Oops. So how long will it be before you've built a good business? And then, of course, what's in it for me? So it kind of boils down I mean, just to really simplify this, how are you going to make money? And if you don't have a good answer to that question, then the conversation's over. If you do have a good answer, then the next question is, well, how will I make money? Because the first question relates to your strength as a prospective business. The second question relates to the deal that we strike. And if we figure out that the only way I'm going to make any money is if I own 97% of your company, that's probably not going to work, right? How will you make money? How will I make money? Pitch decks. Many entrepreneurs overload their pitch decks. Too many words, too much jargon, too long, too technical. The best decks describe the problem in a slide or two. 
focus on the unmet need, how they're meeting the need, and show some support or proof for the value that they're creating. And here's an excellent, also on the Nuts and Bolts website, an excellent example that you should review. So a template you might use, and mind you, everybody pitches in their own way, but here's a starting point. Tell a story, the problem and its consequence. You could say, well, Maria, I, I have spent some time with a mother who's got an eight-year-old daughter, and when the daughter was six, she developed type 1 diabetes. And mom had to spend a bunch of time explaining to her daughter that every day she's going to have to stick a needle in her finger about three times a day and bleed on a little strip to test her blood glucose levels. And there's an issue at night, and the mom is terribly worried that her little daughter is going to slip from being asleep to being in a coma and maybe even die in her sleep. We have an answer for that. And she was quite eager to hear about it. Now, it says prototype. I have to tell you, when I was first raising money for that business, I had a, a little temporary outfit, a little contract manufacturer, made a bunch of the actual bars, the nutrition bars, wrapped them in mylar, which is not oxygen impermeable, so that the bars were going to go stale in about a month rather than the kind of shelf life you need to get into retail chains. So it's a silver foil wrapper, and I used a color printer to print out what the packaging ought to look like, and I wrapped it around a hunk of balsa wood. So when they say, well, what's the stage of your business? I could say, well, we have a prototype. It looks like this, and it tastes like this. Gee, that's pretty good. That's what the mom said, and that's what the daughter said. Consumer uptake. So I didn't need a whole bunch of finished products. I didn't need a bunch of data. I had prototypes. A bar of a hunk of balsa wood with a laser printed wrapper around it and some prototypes in silver foil. But it was enough to say, here's why I want your money. Right? Here's where we are. Here's why I'm raising capital and what I'm going to do with it. And so, Mr. Hadzima, might you have any questions that I can answer before we get to how we're going to structure a deal together? Okay. Your turn. When I've done this in the past, I jumped right into this thing. And it was not really a good idea because most of the people in the audience who had thought they were going to present spent the previous hour mentally rehearsing what they were going to say and ignoring all of my brilliance. It's heartbreaking. But they would stand right up here and give a talk that made it clear that they had not heard a word I'd said. So we're going to try something different this year. We're going to cool our jets for three or four minutes and say nothing while you guys think a little bit. Maybe I'll put a slide or two back up. Think a little bit about how you want to give your talk. What we're going to have is some volunteers give us a three-minute presentation. And then we will ask you for feedback. Your responsibilities are not to give them love, but to give them candor and respect. So listen carefully, critique respectfully, and think about how it might apply to your own situation. So far, so good. You guys with me? Right? So I'm going to ask you when the, the presenter finishes, do you understand the unmet need? Do you understand who he or she thinks has that unmet need and why their solution is better? And if you say, no, all I got out of it was branch chain amino acids uh, compete with tryptophan to get across the blood brain barrier. And I have no idea what he's talking about beyond that. Then we can say to the entrepreneur, you got a little work to do, sport.
Okay? So we're going to sit tight for just a couple minutes, and then I'm going to ask for some volunteers to come down front. All right? Thank you. I just got a, a very important question for something that I omitted, which is who are you going to be presenting to? So you get to tell us that when you come down front and you've got a couple choices. You can declare that you're going to be presenting to someone you might want to hire. And just to make it interesting, let's assume that that person's got three other job offers, several of them for exactly twice what you can afford to pay them. No pressure. You can be presenting to your own team because you had a bad quarter and you're losing money and you're worried that in another 30 days you're not going to be able to make payroll. Or you can be presenting to a prospective investor as to why they should contribute funds to your venture. Thanks for asking the question. Okay. Who's ready? This is, uh, by the way, what I guess the therapy community calls a safe environment. Meaning even if you make a complete train wreck out of this, so what, right? I mean, we're all classmates in this thing. You want to do it? Nobody's got enough practice. All right, come on down. Tell us your name. <laughs> I'm going to give you three minutes and then I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Maria and right now I'm building a mental health technology company, uh, with my co-founder Kelly, who is from Harvard medical school and from MIT, by the way. And the problem we are targeting is for a uh, high stress for working professionals, such as investment bankers, consultants, lawyers, doctors, et cetera. Uh, for myself, when I was investment banker, I saw my colleagues burn out. And mental health is a little bit difficult one to realize because if we break our leg, we can literally see the leg broken. But when it's something with the mind, it takes like longer time for people to realize. And especially for people in high stress for working professionals, for instance, bankers. So... Uh, this can jeopardize, for example, the team culture, can jeopardize a banker's, uh, his own health. And especially for the company, they have to pay for the hospital fees. They have like reputational risks and they also have like cultural risks um, due to the burnout issues for those uh, workers. So right now we have solutions such as like machine learning by analyzing the interactions with your smartphone, um, and uh, on a daily basis, we can predict your mental health, how that change, and so that we can uh, use this um, technology, digital phenotyping, to predict one's mental health situation. 
And uh, what we want to do is to sell this company, uh, to uh, sell this solution to companies uh, in this situation. We did our market research uh, with uh, about 170 uh, answers from the high stressful working professionals. They all identified that current solution uh, only referred to um, online digital platform and they don't have the time like to talk to uh, mental health professionals and they don't realize the need until they got burned out. So we really want to sell this uh, um, automated uh, solution for people to be aware of their mental health issues uh, even they don't have time. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Stay put for a minute while I we seek some feedback. Remember, you owe her candor and respect. We're here to help each other. So, yes, sir. I really like, I really like the idea. I think there is a need. You spoke too fast, way too fast, and you moved too much your hands. So I was looking at your hands and not at thinking about the words. That's like my first idea. Thank you. Mark? Joe, could you, do we have an extra? Oh, we do. It's here. Sorry, I think we're recording this, and so. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Can I use this properly now? Um, uh, <laughs> right. What were you asking for? Like, did you want funding? Did you want? Like, you didn't. I didn't know who you were. But that's probably because of the exercise. Yeah. Uh, actually, the to answer this question, I didn't know. For example what type of audience I was supposed to address. So this is why I didn't, but you were right that I should have asked as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the need that you are addressing is so important and it's great that you're thinking of this type of product. Um, I think with this product, it's a great opportunity to start with a story, maybe if not yours, a personal story for, from somebody else that would have gotten my attention more than how you started. And the second thing is that at the middle of the presentation, I couldn't help but losing my attention and like thinking of something else. And I think it's when you started giving too much information, mm -hmm. too much data. I feel that sometimes one or two pieces of data are enough for your audience to understand. When you go farther than that, I don't need that information and I zoom out. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. So this is a cheap trick. Forgive me. But look on the screen behind you. Did she tell a story? Right. Did she elaborate from there from the story of she'd identified customers who, would, who thought her solution was better? Did she talk about the stage of her business? Did I say some of you would come down front and completely ignore all the brilliant things that I said? <laughs> this is not to say you don't have a good idea. All kidding aside, ladies and gentlemen, it's kind of borderline tragedy, but I have worked with a lot of very smart people who had really good ideas that really would make the world a better place. And they did not get past stage one or stage two, because they were struggling to properly communicate their idea. So this should be uh, an opportunity to really think about that. Your idea in and of itself is not self-sufficient. You have to be able to communicate the benefits first and then convince us that it's real. But Maria was the brave one who went first. Let's give her a round of applause. Nice going. You want to go? Oh, well, then come on down. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. After I blow it up. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, am I, I'm going to address you as prospective partners because we've got a problem. How many of you are not from the US and need visa, need immigration issues? I think all of you know the problem that it is or the problem that represents to have your papers in order and you come here and you want to work and you want to add value. And that is an issue that we, we need to address. 
how do, I, do we address it? I am an attorney, and I know about immigration law. However, I know most of the things that we need to do in order to get those paper, papers in order are uh, usually uh, through documentation, no legal advice. Most of you guys have the technical background to make data flow. Most of the documents we need to get our papers in order are pure data. Can we not work together in order to get that problem solved? So my pitch here is who would want to join into a venture where we could systematize the legal part and the technical part in order to make this process fair, easy, and solvable, instead of having to call immigration lawyers that will charge you a fee for only so much work. So thank you so much. Well, I offered a hypothesis that most of us are only likely to remember three things when someone presents. Who can tell us the one, two, or three things that they will remember from his talk? Go ahead. Okay, another. <laughs> He's an attorney looking for a day job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I heard what I wanted to hear there. <laughs> right. No, we'll skip all the lawyer jokes. <laughs> sorry. Um, By the way, that's a lie. I'm a corporate lawyer, but. <laughs> all right. What advice would you give him if he were to do it again tomorrow night? He's not, but to help him do a better job. I mean, we are here for, you know, continuous improvement. What advice could you offer him? Um, I really like your approach. Uh, one thing, it might be nothing at all, but you refer the audience as guys. So when you say, hey, guys, that probably costs you half of your audience who are females. So that might be an issue because you don't want to cast them out in the first place. So maybe you, I don't know, maybe refer them to people or ladies and gentlemen. Or good evening, everyone. Right. And Mark, you were going to offer a word of advice? Like this. <laughs> My musician friends call that Dane Bramage. Um, Aaron, if you'd hand that to Alyssa, please. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea as well. I think as a consumer, I would probably be interested in, is it, is it actually easier for me to organize my, my paperwork or is it another app that I think will be another step in the process? Like, how is it going to cut down on my frustration and my, you know, the time that I input into the whole thing instead of adding to it, I guess but I think it's a wonderful, wonderful idea. Okay, we don't answer that question, but the point is if, it out. If, if she needs the, an answer, then you need to build that into your talk. But, all right, let's give him a hand, please. You may, you may be the last one up. Joe, do I stop at 725 or 730? 725, okay. Trains run on time here. You're welcome. Hello. So the art, uh, um, let's start. So the audience that I'm presenting to are people who I want to inform. Um, whether that's venture capitalists or later, we can decide. Sure. Sure. Hello. Okay, here. Not this. <laughs> okay. So I once what uh, I once met a woman, and she lost her grandmother to a fire, and she also lost all of her grandmother's belongings to the fire, and now her grandmother was an avid Barbie collector. And she wanted to go back and she wanted to help relive her memories with her grandmother by going and buying all the Barbies that she had. 
So she sets about going on eBay. And when she goes on eBay, all she sees are these naked dolls that have that are covered in this kind of markings and, you know, from different markers, but also liquids we might or might not identify at this point. And she's seeing them being sold for hundreds of dollars. This ruins the experience for her as a collector, as someone who wants to relive the experiences and memories as a grand, of her grandmother. Now, this is a story that millions of collectors are actually experiencing across the world. For collectors, collectibles in their collection, they represent a story. They represent a memory and an intangible emotion that they care about deeply. But now, with the presence of scalpers that are infiltrating the platforms, all they see is half-marked items that are selling for way more. And guess what? They don't even get sold at all because of the just sheer exorbitant prices that they're being presented for on these platforms. So here I'm going to introduce to you the concept of a new platform called Memoa. And here's where collectors can document the memories and the stories they have which, with each item in their collection. This requires a level of engagement from participants that would deter ordinary scalpers or people who are just looking to make a lot of money. And with this, this standardizes the prices at which collectors are willing to pay because collectors have trust in each other and they know what to expect from the other person. On eBay, Mercari, and any other selling platform, currency is exchanged, money is exchanged, and information is exchanged. Here we present a new kind of transaction, one of memories and sentiments. Thank you. Come on, you stay there. Thank you. Hi. Okay. Your comments? Hello? Wait for the microphone. Uh, so I love that you were super clear and uh, you also tell the story very, very well, like uh, the story of your grandmother, basically. And uh, what I would love is that something that, it, uh, the story that can connect to audience who are collectible of this generation, uh, like Marvel or something else that, that, that like, that would be a great story as well. That's all my call. Excellent. Anyone else? Go ahead. Oh, here we go, Aaron. All right, Maria. Uh, me too. I really like the storytelling side and really made me rethink about my own pitch and the, what the impact can be like with the storytelling. This is something I really enjoyed. And the something I found a little bit unclear, like for myself, it's right now I know it's like compared to eBay, it's a new way of transaction that can keep memory, but then I'm not very like clear about like what, What's it actually? It's like how can you like keep the memory? At yeah. Time? She had me with the fire. <laughs> so she started talking about losing all of her possessions and all of her Barbies. I mean, I didn't collect Barbies, but I can, you know, I've got a few guitars I would surely miss. <laughs> and it's like, whoa. <laughs> and just parenthetically, um, the first investor in this diabetes business was someone who had lost his sister to exactly the problem that we were there to solve. And you never know when you tell a story like this, whether or not they've had a family member who's gone through exactly the problem that you're there to solve. He wrote a fat check before he ever learned any of the particulars about the team. He really wanted to see our solution succeed. Nice job. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to say farewell. I will be back on Thursday night to, for the wrap-up. You remember that last week I told you a quick story about we asked a bunch of entrepreneurs what their advice would be to a group of potential entrepreneurs, and they all said, don't do it. And I promised Thursday night that I would tell you why they said that. So stay tuned. Here's a little summary. Great presentations are not accidental. They take planning, they take practice. You need to have an understanding of who your audience is. What are they worried about? What are they interested in? And implicitly tell them why they will be better off. So think about the three talks that 
you guys gave and ask yourself, do I understand why the people who buy their product or service will be better off? And remember that they are thinking, they won't say it, but they're thinking, what's in it for me? Know the three things you want them to remember when you finish your presentation. Build your presentation with that focus and practice. Good luck, and thank you very much. Thank you.